Church is a little different now. Small groups are meeting. Uh, some are online. Some are meeting in homes like ours. We've had to take a pause on a week and then get back together and get a pause. And, and it, it's just, it can be very frustrating to find yourselves out of the swing of normal life in the church to be out of um, the way that you're used to doing ministry. Church and ministry is built on relationships and people and building a relationship with people in your neighborhood to reach your community for Christ and to reach out to your family and to invite them to church and to invite them to a small group and to be out and living life as a as a disciple of Jesus Christ, salt and light where God has placed you. And then we find ourselves in kind of a, um, a, a waiting, holding pattern at this point. And uh, it can be frustrating. And, and you know what? Hebrews has been very good for me because there's some, so much foundational truth. And so you can see my Bible here. And so foundational truth for us to study, to build, that we build our life upon. And we need that foundation strong. And this is a way for us to bolster that. of What we believe in Jesus, who he was and what he has done. And this might not be um, in our first glance, so practical. You know, it's not like, how do we get along better with our wives? Uh, how do we have better relationships with our kids? And all those things, they come through the scriptures too. And we teach them and talk about them and they're vitally important too. But these are foundational truths that at the outset might not have uh, immediate application. We don't think what they do. They're foundational for who we are in God, in Jesus Christ. And they make a difference for our whole life. But I pray that uh, this would bolster you. Maybe it's good that we have a timeout where we can know what we believe and why we believe it and hold on to it and be stronger in it than ever in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then when we get to those other messages later on, when we're out doing life again, normally, Lord willing, soon, we'll be able to rejoice that we have a strong foundation. Um, and so that's what the book of Hebrews is. It's, it's, it's for, and it, it was preached and written to, uh, people who were under um, hardships, they were struggling. And uh, this is meant to bolster their faith, to encourage them to stick with Christ Jesus, who is our great high priest. And that's what we're studying today. And so um, the main point, I just want to start out here. The main point of the message uh, today is found in verse 9. And the main point is this, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. But that's the truth, and that's what we want to uh, expound upon today from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Let me read it. If you got your Bibles, grab them. Go to Hebrews chapter 5 or your devices. Hebrews 5, chapter 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only one called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as he says in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, <clears throat> thank you for Jesus, the source of eternal salvation for us. I pray that you would remind us of our Savior today by looking at this text, by understanding the category of a high priest and how Jesus is our great high priest, that that would impact us at the very foundational level, it would make us stronger in our faith. It would bolster our faith. It would send us from this place. Pumped up, fired up, excited to live for our Savior, Jesus. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done for us. 
Help me, Holy Spirit, teach us exactly the things that you want us to know from this text. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, to help us understand uh, the text today, we have to understand uh, some of the categories. You remember last week we talked about the question of, well, why didn't God send Jesus, the Messiah, earlier? Why was there 2,000 years between the ancient Israelites and the book of Matthew? Why, why all this time? Well, God is teaching us uh, through the nation of Israel, which is supposed to be a light to all the nations. He is teaching us about who he is and how he relates to us sinful people. And one of the things that we learn, and it helps us to understand who Jesus is as the Messiah, is we learn about how man relates to God, and specifically how a priest is then the mediator between God and man. That was laid out in the Old Testament. We'll see here in a minute, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 29. And so we have to understand what a priest is. Now, when I say a priest, you have all sorts of things that come to your mind, don't you? I would say, hey, just call it out. But uh, a lot of those things aren't very good, are they, today, uh, unfortunately, uh, from some of the uh, uh, molestations and, and some of the abuses of the office of a priest in certain religious circles. It's downright embarrassing uh, to even be put in the same camp as some of them. I, I remember when I was a kid, we go around the classroom. What does your fam? What does your dad do? What does your mom and dad do for a living in? I quickly learned uh, that I would be made fun of when I said my dad was a pastor. Nobody knew what a pastor was in the area that I lived at the time. They were all Catholic. So they said, well, is that like a priest? Is your dad a priest? And then how does that work? How, how does a priest have kids? And ha, 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 very funny. And they, they didn't understand what a pastor was. We don't understand what a priest is as well. But here we, we see expounded upon what a priest does, who he is, what he does, in relation to the people of God. First, number one, high priests were appointed. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. Then, it, And then verse 4, too, it reiterates that no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So number one, high priests were appointed. Appointed. Now, this is a big deal. Uh, we might not think that this is a big deal, but uh, it, it is. It goes back to um, Exodus chapter 29. Here we see how uh, Aaron was appointed by God to be a priest. Exodus chapter 29, the first um Number verse one. Now, this is what you shall do to them. That's the priests to consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. Take one bowl of the herd and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them a fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket. You shall bring the bowl and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. And then the instruction goes on. The big idea here is that God appointed the high priest that were to serve as a mediator between God and the people. So the nation of Israel, in order to be right with God, the God of heaven and earth, the God of uh, Yahweh, I am who I am, says the Lord God Almighty, who led them out of slavery in Egypt, in order to have a relationship with him, he is holy. He is unlike us in his holiness and his righteousness. And so in order to have a right relationship, there was put in place a mediator called the high priest. This high priest would then offer sacrifices for the sin, his own sin, and also for the sin of the people. Um, the Day of Atonement would come each year where the priest would uh, offer up these sacrifices, bring the blood of the lamb, and sacrifice to the Lord God. This priest wasn't just grabbed from anywhere. This priest was appointed. Now, we might not think that's 
that big of a deal. Uh, but it is a, a big of a deal. It's uh, um, we're going to see later on that uh, even specifically how the priests were chosen. That's the third point here. It makes a difference in how today we relate to God when we think of how we come to him. But number one, high priests were appointed. Number two, high priests atoned for sin. This is verse one, two. They offered gifts and sacrifices for sins. That term gifts and sacrifices can be uh, generally meant to be together. It's the sacrifices that are offerings to God, that are gifts to God on behalf of the people to atone for the sin of, of the people. This would happen. They would atone for their sin. They would bring the blood of a spotless lamb uh, to God on behalf of the people. Now you say, well, why, why did these gifts, why did these sacrifices need to happen? Why did God set it up this way? Later on in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, we read that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And that is an, uh, an expansion on Leviticus 17, 11, which talks about this, that the, the blood is, is life, and that is to be given to God. And so I want to help you think about this, because I remember last week I talked about some of us, we ask questions more so than others. Some of us would just say, okay, well, we need a sacrifice before God. We need to give blood. But why, why that? Why would God do that? Well, the, the simplest way that I can uh, think to explain it um, is this. If you did something horrendous, terrible, the worst thing that you could ever do, say that would be murdering somebody, that would be probably the thing that would come to your mind, what would be the thing that you could do to make up for it? Well, the greatest thing that anyone can do is to give of their life, right? That's the greatest payment that you have is your life. And the life is in the blood. You don't have any blood. You don't have life. So God, in his infinite holiness, demands perfection. That's who his being is. And, and, and he has justice in his being. And so the murderer just can't come and approach God and say, hey, what's up, God? But also, neither can the stealer, uh, neither can the liar, neither can the sinner of any stripe come to God without making atonement for sin. And the greatest thing that they can do, because they, they're guilty of the greatest thing, which is sin, the greatest thing is Blood is, is their life. And so God, in his system, made it through an animal's blood, a spotless lamb that would picture the coming lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. That would be the offering, the gift, the sacrifice that represented, God, I give you everything. I give you my life as I turn and repent of my sins. And that's the sacrificial system. And here, this is how the high priests atoned for their own sin and for the sin of the people. Now, how they did it was uh, very interesting. Verse 2, these priests can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Now, if you think of that, this is a... Um, a beautiful thing uh, that 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 the priest, uh, the high priest, the, the one that's appointed by God, is to be a man of, of gentleness, a man of understanding. Who, if you can picture an ancient Israelite coming before uh, the high priest, before uh, the entrance to the holy of holies, before God, with the sacrificial lamb, and placing his hands on the lamb on behalf of his family, confessing their sin unto the Lord with the priest there, the high priest there, weeping before God for the sin that is so prevalent in their life, confessing their sin unto this lamb 
the high priest deals with him gently. The high priest isn't there saying, hurry this up a little bit. I got some place to go. Okay, no, the, the priest would no doubt have tears in his eyes because he knows that's him. That's him as well. And he just did that same thing. He offers sacrifice for himself, verse 3, for his own sins, just as he does for the sin of the people. This is a gentle thing. And, and, and just imagine it. Uh, it was also seen in the in the high priest's clothing. They had a, a, a breastplate that they would wear on which were the 12 stones that represented the 12 tribes of Israel, the names of the tribes and the stones. And so the people would not only be uh, on the heart of the high priest, um, but physically represented on the heart of the high priest. This is what the high priest did, who he was. Now, this has application to us today because we as Christians now, and as the church, there is such a thing called the priesthood of all believers. We have the great high priest, Jesus, who is our advocate, who is our mediator, but we, because of him, can go directly to the throne of grace, and, and we have a priesthood of all believers. Therefore, the church should be ones who practice this gentleness better than anybody. We should not be a people who say, hey, you better get your act together and clean it up before you come around here. Oh, how are you still struggling with this? You should be past that by now. Hey, there are There is a time for tough love. I, I get that. But we should be a people like the priests who were gentle because we know our own hearts and our own sin. And so we practice compassion and love to those who come to God. To come to the church. The high priests were appointed. High priests atoned for sin. And then thirdly, high priests were from the order of Aaron. Now back to Exodus chapter 29. Here's where um, the verses continue where they talk about specifically Aaron. Exodus 29, we left off Verse 5, then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron and the coat, and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and the gird, and gird him with skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Now, the priesthood was appointed by God to the line of Aaron. It went to Aaron, Aaron's sons, and their sons, and their sons, and their sons. Now, there are cases uh, throughout the Old Testament where some people tried to take that position for themselves. You remember the Korah. And, uh, and his sons, and, and they tried to take the position of uh, of the priests, and the earth opened up and swallowed them, and, and they're toast. Okay, they 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 weren't from the line of Aaron. King Saul tried to take upon himself the priestly duties, and uh, not only because of that, because of other things, but he lost the kingship of the nation of Israel. King Uzziah he was another one who tried to make sacrifices himself. I, I, I believe he. Uh, was struck with leprosy. You'll have to check that out yourself, King Uzziah. Um, this is a big deal. You might think it's kind of not. I mean, that God appointed the line of Aaron. Many people today, they think that they're the high priest. They're their own high priest. That they can go to God the way that they want to go with God. Forget about the Bible. Forget about the way that he's laid it out. Forget about the categories that he's explained to us through his word. Forget about Jesus even. I'm good with God. God knows me. I'm my own high priest. I remember about 10 years ago at a funeral. Um, funeral was for someone who was loosely associated with the church. And many people that came into the church weren't from the church. Maybe only probably three or four people who were there to help with the service were there. But probably a hundred other people were there for this man who had died. And one of the guys uh, in in the, in the service that day, I got to talk to, with him a little bit afterwards. Was a 
was a tough, strong guy. I remember last week I talked about a guy that I had to bat that I got the chance to baptize and lead to the Lord. It was awesome. It's great. He was a tough guy, guy that you wouldn't want to get in a fight with. Well, this was a tough guy that you wouldn't want to get in a fight with either. Um, but he didn't get baptized and he didn't come around. And I, I kind of, I talked to him a little bit about, well, where do you stand? It was after the service. I said, what do you think about everything I said? I, I delivered the gospel, said, uh, choose this day who you're going to serve, that you are standing before God yourself. Eventually let this time, this death remind you of that truth. What about you? He said, well, uh, me and God, we're okay. I said, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a man upstairs. He, 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 he understands me and I understand him. I said, oh, well, how, how'd you get that understanding? I just have it. Yeah, I just have it and he knows me and we're all good. Well, I got in a fight with him. I'm just kidding. No, I didn't get in a fight with him. No, I just said, what I said was, well, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And, uh, and, and so that was the way that we left it. But he, he didn't hear it. He didn't take it. He, he was his own priest. It's a big deal. In the Old Testament, there were no other priests other than the line of Aaron. And one other line of priesthood that we're going to see from the line of Melchizedek that's coming up here in a second. So that's the picture, the category of the high priest in the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 5. But then the second half talks about how Jesus fulfills this role. I mean, if you see it in your notes, Jesus is our great high priest. And while similar, he is different. He is. He's different. He's better. He's awesome. Number one, Jesus was appointed as the son. Look at the text. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. So Jesus himself didn't appoint himself to be a priest, but he was appointed by God who said, you are my son. The day I have begotten you. Now, this is interesting because you would think as you read this passage, verse 5, he did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but it was appointed by him who said, you are my priest, my high priest. That's what you would think it would say. Jesus did not exalt himself to be a priest, but then God says, not you are the priest. God says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Jesus was appointed as a son, as part of the Godhead, part of the Trinity. He stepped into time as the baby Jesus born in a manger died on the cross of Calvary, rose again from the dead, all at the plan of the Father. And what he did in this, Jesus atoned for sin through his suffering. Jesus offered up, verse 7, during his days in the flesh, prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. You think of the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus died, he was, he was going to die. He was going to the cross. And in agony, he wept and prayed before God. And he prayed, God, let this cup, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. What was the cup? The cup was what he was about to drink. Not literally, but figuratively. And in the cup, where were your sins and my sin? And he was going to drink the wrath of God upon our sin. The wrath in the cup. The wrath of God upon our sin was in the cup. And if it was possible, let this cup pass from me, Jesus prayed, but not my will, but your will be done. He prayed loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. He was heard. He did die, but death did not hold him. The grave could not keep him. Jesus rode, rose from the dead. He conquered death. He was heard by God. And although he was a son, verse 8, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all 
who obey him. Now, a couple notes on the text. Hang with me here. The first one is this. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. What does that mean? Was he not obedient? And then he learned obedience. And then verse 9, and being made perfect, and being made perfect, was he not perfect already? So let's dig a little bit into these verses just to understand what they mean. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. He learned obedience. Now, one of the things that we have, what happened to us in our life, is we learn um, deeper ways of of of, uh, of obedience. Right? It's easy to obey when we want to do the thing that we're being asked to do. If mom and dad says, "Hey," I want you to I want you to play five hours of video games tonight. You're like, okay, mom and dad, uh, I'm going to obey, no problem. That's that sort of obedience um, isn't that hard, right? Um, but the obedience in suffering to do that which hurts you, to do to do that which you don't see the final outcome, to do that which is hard. That's another thing. Now we know that Jesus was obedient before he suffered. Because verse 15 of the previous chapter, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So the author has already said he is without sin. He already is obedient. But he learns obedience through suffering. He went to greater depths of obedience as Jesus walked to the earth as our high priest. And then, in the same way, being made perfect can have a sense, this perfection of completeness. And so it wasn't that Jesus was not perfect already. He was, but he was made more perfect. He was made more complete. Back in chapter 2 of Hebrews, verse 10 We read, for it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So it was fitting that Jesus, who is perfect, who always was perfect, through suffering, he became complete. He became more perfect in who he was. Jesus, he atoned for our sin. He went to the cross as the perfect atoning sacrifice for us to atone for our sin through his suffering. And then thirdly, Jesus is from the order of Melchizedek. Now, I'm just going to tell you more on Melchizedek in chapter 7. This is a, a very interesting topic of conversation. If you've been around the Bible at all, the Bible studies, and it's fun to speculate and to talk about Melchizedek and who he is and what he d- did and what he represents. And we're going to get that some of it here. We're not going to touch really it now, but later on in chapter 7 we will. Melchizedek is an interesting character that shows up in the Old Testament. He's the king of Salem, the king of Jerusalem. He is uh, not only a priest of God Most High, priest of God, he is also a king. And it's an interesting thing. And then he shows up in, in the Psalms, which is quoted uh, right here in verse 6. And this is who Melchizedek uh, was. And um, in the big idea that we won't expand upon today, but just talk about a little bit, is that um, the order of Melchizedek is an e- e- eternal order that is not bound upon a nationality or a people group. Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, this would be so essential for the Hebrews who are reading this or hearing it preached because they could be confused. How is Jesus our great high priest? Jesus is not from the tribe of the Levites. Jesus is not from the order of Aaron, the line of Aaron. Jesus, as a matter of fact, when Jesus was alive, he seemed to be an adversary to the temple and to the priests and to the Pharisees who who, who lived and ran and, and ruled there. So how is Jesus our great high priest? Well, here 
Our author says he's not in the order of Aaron. Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek. It's an eternal order, an order not bound by nationality or ethnicity. Jesus is Savior. He is priest to all, to all who obey him. That is the point. Remember verse 9, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. This is not works righteousness. This is not works salvation. This is believing in Christ, taking that step of faith. That's the first step of obedience, is to believe and then to follow Jesus Christ with your life. Now, I just want to say that um, for the nation of Israel, they do not have a day uh, of atonement anymore. They have it still, but they don't offer sacrifices anymore. Now, some of them, maybe they'll fast on the day of atonement. I think it was uh, September 14th this past year. They would fast, and they would, uh, in, in, in that way, sacrifice uh, to God, since they don't do the sacrifices anymore, and they would sacrifice uh, by uh, doing something like fasting, doing something good. It's the Jewish people that at the end of the day then would hope that the good would outweigh the bad, that they would do more good than evil, that God would accept them on the basis of their self-sacrifice. We are, are not accepted that way. Friend, hear me. If that's your hope, whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish or who you are, your hope is in yourself as your own high priest that you're going to be good enough, that you're going to do it life well enough, that you're not going to screw up enough, and that God at the end of the day will look at you and say, well, if the good outweighs the bad, good job. Come on into heaven. That is not the way that God has ordained your salvation to work. He has appointed Jesus as your great high priest, and eternal salvation belongs in him to all who obey him. Obey Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So do you believe in Jesus? Ask him to come into your heart right now if you don't. Lord Jesus, forgive me for I'm a sinner. I accept your sacrifice on my behalf on the cross. Come into my heart. Make me a new person. Save me from my sin, from death, from the devil. Lord I want the life, eternal life that you give. And I ask this in Jesus' name, God, your high priest. Amen. That's an awesome thing. If, if you prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time ever or for the second time or for the hundredth time, I'd love to hear about it. And uh, you can text me, give me a call, write down the friendship registry. I'd love to talk to you about it and talk about next steps too. This is an awesome thing, the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. It's foundational uh, for us as we build our life upon it. I'm going to ask you to stand, and uh, I'm at a disadvantage because I can't see if you're going to do what I ask or not, but I'm going to ask you to stand and receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you give you peace. Amen. Amen. Hope to see you next week.